You know, and, and Patricia, you know, the First Nations uh, people who uh, you are a major spokesperson for are often on the front lines, both figuratively, both liter figuratively and literally on the front lines uh, when it comes to the fight against climate change, especially uh, when we're talking about very damaging uh, oil and gas exploration, for example. And some of the uh, what we talk about rights of nature that Thomas is referring to has its uh, has its origins in tribal law. And uh, you actually see that even though, um, you know, a lot of Native Americans uh, tragically uh, are living in pretty severe poverty, certainly here in the United States, uh, as well as uh, elsewhere uh, in North America, like in Canada, for example, uh, they they're actually do hold a lot of power, especially for these proposed pipelines that might go through uh, reservation. So if you could tell us about some of the steps uh, that have been taken by First Nations people uh, to to fight against uh, a lot of these environmentally catastrophic measures. Yeah, so, uh, you know, one thing that's very interesting is so the, the I'm in, my family are Inuit from northern Labrador, Nunatsiava is the name of our territory. And, um, you know, we actually have sea ice at, listed as part of our treaty uh, with the Canadian government and um, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador because sea ice for us is a is an extension of the land, um, and it is uh, it is melting and becoming less predictable at um, at a, an incomprehensible rate. You know, so the traditional knowledge that we have had and used for thousands of years to navigate um, and to feed ourselves. Uh, that is, uh, unfortunately, you know, like because of how rapidly uh, our climate is changing, um, we are struggling at times to be able to travel safely uh, in the winter and spring as we normally would have. Um, and so uh, for us, you know, we really are the canaries in the coal mine when it comes to climate change in Canada and indeed climate change across the world because we can see our weather changing and we can see that, you know, the information that is being passed down to us from our elders um, sometimes uh, isn't matching up with what happens when we actually get out on the land, as we say, when we go fishing and hunting and those kinds of things. Our communities suffer with extremely high rates of food insecurity um, because of the uh, structural colonialism that we've faced um, from uh, the Canadian state and the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, and so for us, you know, we've always seen ourselves as part of nature. And one of the things that uh, Western law does is it separates people from nature. So it says, you know, people have these kinds of rights and nature doesn't have any rights, but, you know, nature is treated as an object. But for us, nature is living and we are part of the life that is being lived. You know, we are part of that ecosystem um, as hunters and gatherers. You know, when we gather uh, berries, we also are spreading seeds. Um, and when we, you know, uh, take, if, you know, when you cor correctly harvest eggs, it actually encourages birds to lay more eggs, you know. And so uh, I was very excited to be able to work with Thomas because for me, I think that the approach that they're taking, it so uh, easily translates, you know, some of this knowledge that has been passed through our families for uh, thousands of years uh, into Western law. And I think that's a very exciting approach for us. In terms of things, you know, some of our, um, as we say, cousins uh, out west in uh, British Columbia, I want to give a, a big shout out to my friend uh, Denzel Sutherland Wilson, who's a land protector, who's Gixan uh, from northern British Columbia. And so in BC, we're seeing the, um, uh, we're seeing Wet'suwet'en folks and Gixan, their uh, allies fighting against the coastal gas link pipeline, um, which was bought by the uh, Canadian government actually and so now the Canadian government is paying for this private what should have been private infrastructure and then you know probably will sell it back to private infrastructure below cost right and so you know there are these ways that our governments not only are they you know not stopping and divesting from fossil fuels they're actually subsidizing fossil fuels and you know they're subsidizing fossil fuels when the water at my cousin's house in Riglet is brown right and so you can see the way that colonialism builds in structural inequality, and it also isolates us as, particularly as Inuit, so we're the people who live in the, in the Arctic, and the high Arctic, and there is only two Inuit communities in Canada that are actually interconnected by road to the rest of the country, and they're only interconnected seasonally with the ice road in the winter and spring in the Western Arctic. And so as Inuit, we are particularly cut off from this nation that we had no 
uh, choice in becoming a part of. Um, and so it's very difficult for us to be able to um, to be able to speak to the issues that are so important from us because most Canadians are never going to travel to the Arctic. Most people never make it up uh, up north. And so uh, not only are they never going to make it there, they're also never going to understand how drastic the changes that we're seeing are um, because they don't live there full time, you know, even if they do actually make it up for a visit. 